this evening we'll take a look back at Benair Kiva in Manchester. But first, please remember tonight is the time to donate. So please go to benairkiva.co.cc and please give as much as you can. The new Northern Bight is 21 years old, but before that, the previous Bight was a big old house on the same site. It was apparent that the building was falling into disrepair. Not only that, but it was far too expensive to maintain. Let's take a glimpse at the old Bight.
always had Stiefheim and field workers since before the bite was opened. Here are just a few of them from over the years. My name is Daniel Gillis and together with my brother Shimon, we were northern field workers from 5769 to 5771. We are sorry we can't be with you this evening as we are in Israel. B'nai Kiva is a phenomenal organisation, taking Hanachim at six years old and instilling in them values of Torah, Avodah and Aliyah and making them future leaders. We hope this evening is successful and that Manchester B'nai Kiva goes from strength to strength. Shalom, I'm Danny Irini. And I'm Dorit. And we were the B'nai Kiva Shluchim in Manchester between 1994 and 1996. Our eldest daughter, Ergan, was born in Manchester 17 years ago. She is a Mank Union. Today we have four kids, Baruch Hashem. And we still live in Peduel in the Shomron. Till today we have very good memories from the warm, wonderful and wonderful Zionist community of BA Manchester. And we want to wish the Bnei of Manchester family to continue educating the kids and the youth in Am Israel, Torah Israel and Eretz Israel. We wish Dubai to be full of activities and a center of Zionism and Aliyah in Manchester. Hello everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Noam. I was Shaliach in Dubai uh, six years ago. I'm very, very excited to be one of the, uh, the people that congratulate you for the anniversary. So first of all, congratulations for the anniversary of the bite. I want to tell you that when I was in Manchester, it was, everything was really nice, apart from the weather, apart from the weather, okay. Um, all the people were very welcoming and hosted us for Shabbat meals and helped us with everything we needed. Really, thank you for that. But the, th the one thing I think that made my shlichut <coughs> so meaningful was the fact that I worked with an amazing youth, the youth of uh, Bnei Akiva. And I think it's not an ordinary um, and regular youth. I th what I saw in, in the Bnei Akiva guys, boys and girls, I saw that they are very, they are really striving in order to get to something that is true, in order to be whoever they want, they need to be. And I saw a lot of honesty and a lot of maturity, which are, I think, really rare for people in these ages. So I'm very proud of being a Shaliach in Manchester and I want to thank all the amazing people that I met and I wish you all to continue with a really amazing education and with always trying to be better and to be honest and all the things that I said now. <laughs> so congratulations, Mazal Tov. Uh, you are now seeing me, but I hope to see you as well. So, Mazal Tov and good luck in the future. BA is a unique organization for our children and young adults, creating a love of Torah, Avodah and Aliyah. It has become the UK's largest Zionist Jewish youth movement, with over 2,000 people involved. Members of B'nai Akiva regularly progress to become Jewish communal leaders, both here and in Israel. The focal point for BA in the North is the Manchester Bayat. The Bayat has offices, spaces for learning and davening, as well as rooms for Chavirim to spend time and run events in a safe and meaningful environment. It is the centre of the religious Zionist community. It also provides accommodation for the Shlichim from Israel. The Sulfur Sniff, based in the Bayat, regularly attracts more than 150 Hanachim each week, as well as providing Minyanim over Shabbat. To ensure the Bayat is here for years to come, please donate. You can donate online at bineakiva.co.cc and click Donate Now. For full terms and conditions, please go to bineakiva.co.cc and click Terms and Conditions. Thank you.
Yes, that's right. Please, please donate. It's vital for events in Benetti in the north to continue. Mark Weinberg sadly died back in 2010. Mark is sorely missed, but he was without a doubt one of the most amazing masculine Benetti the UK has ever had. He ran Benetti confidently and with vision, and the vision he gave Benetti still lives on. Mark was masked here back in 1999. He gave a short speech at the first Benerki the Eurovision about Benerki in the North and its ideology. Um, I really just want to speak for two minutes to say um, welcome to all Chabot Benerki from Europe. Uh, we really appreciate you coming here and joining in with us in this event. I think when I go around the country and see all the Stivots, I always ask Chabot uh, Benerki what do you think you're a part of? Where do you think you come from? And I think people don't realise that Benerki is not just a club. It's not just in your community in North Manchester, Cheadle, Hendon, Glasgow, Newcastle, or anywhere like that. Benerki is an ideology. It's something that goes on in the whole world. Something that people believe in throughout the world. And just here, in this community here today, this school here today, we see representatives from all over the world. There are about 200,000 people who are part of the movement, who are halfway to their keep in the world, and that's something to be proud of. And here in Great Britain, I think we're one of the jewels in the crown. And that's not down to the mosque, that's not down to the mosque, that's down to the people sitting here in front of me. I'd just like to say thank you to every single one of you to making Benair Kiva for what it really is in Great Britain and Ireland. I think I couldn't pass this event without saying a massive, massive thank you to our northern team of Simon Wanis and Anup. I think in years gone past, there's always been, you know, the south, the north, where Benair Kiva's priorities are. I know on a personal level, both to Simon Wanit and Anup, we've had a fantastic relationship. I really, really think something like this shows that you've put the North back on the map, that it's the strongest part of Benair Kiva in Great Britain and Ireland. I really, really want to say thank you, not just for this, but I think the impact that you have on every single Khanif in the northern, in northern England. It really, really is a tribute to all three of you. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you to all the Europeans. We couldn't do it without all you out there. Hashem in my Now, every few years, there's a national weekend, which is widely attended by the northern communities. National weekend is a landmark event in the Benerki of the calendar. And at the last one, it was estimated that over 1,300 people attended. Let's take a look back at the highlights of the last national weekend held in 2006. began speaking in public, there has been one opening line I've been dying to use, and tonight is the night Chief Rabbi, Lord and Lady Sachs, Lady Steenberg, Rabonim, honoured guests, the Maskirot of B'nai Akiva, Bogrim, Madrichim, Chanichim, and fellow supporters of B'nai Akiva in Salford and Manchester. Welcome to this evening's 21st anniversary celebration 
of the opening of the Salford Bayat. In 1991, thanks to the enthusiasm and dedication of a group of willing committee workers led by the indefatigable Herzl Hamburger, the rebuilding of the Bayat was completed. A brand new purpose-built modern building was replacing a ramshackle dilapidated old house. And incidentally, while looking at the pictures of the committee members from those days, I noticed the building appears to have aged better than some of those committee members. And the bite's in not a great shape either. As I said previously, tonight is a light-hearted evening of celebration. So please relax, enjoy the evening, and feel free to reminisce about the old days at B'nai Kiva. And look back in pride, with pride, at the achievements made by all those Chanichim, Madrichim, and Bogrim, who spent many happy hours at the Bayit, enabling B'nai Kiva to become the best, largest, most successful Zionist youth movement in the whole of England today. As I have had a very hectic seven days, culminating in my return from London late last night, after a heavy week of Sheva Brachot following my son's marriage last Sunday, I might sound quite a bit jaded. And although tonight's evening is meant to be full of wit, you are having to listen to me while tired. And therefore, at the moment, I'm only a half-wit. So please accept my apologies. I see tonight's event is billed as an evening of nostalgia and humour. What am I meant to do? Am I the nostalgia or the humour? As far as B'nai Kiva nostalgia goes, I could recall my days at camp, Aleph camp, Bet Chalotzi, Hadracha course, but what happens on camp stays on camp. So I will leave the nostalgia to other people. So I will just proceed, hopefully, with the humour. But what humour is suitable for tonight with such an array of honoured guests? What kind of humour does Lord Sachs like? Panic of panics. Does the Chief Rabbi have a sense of humour? But then I discovered he supports Arsenal, so I know he does. <laughs> Talking of Arsenal, I read an article in the Times 2 a couple of weeks ago, which listed the 50 things that makes you middle class. And there at number 10 was Arsenal. And it said, middle class men with their beards and trendy glasses are strangely attracted to Arsenal Football Club above all others. So even Chief Rabbi, if your team isn't a class above United and City, you at least are a class above their supporters. <laughs> As local people who know me, they're probably thinking, Michal, chairing a dinner with the Chief Rabbi in attendance, that sounds like a cookery programme, a recipe for disaster. Well, admittedly, it's a bit like Michael McIntyre doing a gig at the Vatican, Le Havdil. <laughs> but I promise to behave myself. So apologies to those who are expecting my below the gartle approach <laughs> and the only crudities tonight we had at the reception. <laughs> so what Uber is apt for tonight as I stand here in front of the chief rabbi and a sprinkling of rabonim? I've got the perfect solution. I know what humour. It says in Mishnayis Moed, Masechus humour. Im hoya chacham k'doresh v'im laf namani kidi. I just wanted to show you that my yeshiva days weren't wasted. That might be your humour, 
but it's not mine. I'm more a Noshin man. <laughs> Tonight, I've been given the honour of introducing our guest speaker. I'm sure all previous chairmen during his distinguished career who have had the privilege of introducing him have said, our next speaker needs no introduction and then promptly carry on to ramble for 20 minutes listing his wonderful achievements. Do you think I'm going to be any different? Chief Rabbi, I can imagine when you open your invitation for tonight when you eagerly ripped open the envelope, or maybe in St. John's Wood you have people to do it for you. <laughs> An evening of nostalgia and humour chaired by Michal Matlin. <laughs> Who's Michal Matlin, you must have said. Well, to tell you the truth, I opened my envelope. In Salford, we have to do it ourselves. <laughs> so, guest speaker Jonathan Sachs. Who's he, I said. <laughs> so I thought I'd best Google him. Firstly, I checked to see if he was one of those Rabonim at the Asifa who signed the declaration at the public meeting banning the internet. I believe the Asifa was at Leighton Orient's football ground. By the way, that was the biggest crowd they got that year. <laughs> Actually, the Times said it was a good attendance as usual. <laughs> But isn't it funny that all the pictures of the Asifa and all the discussions, letters, edicts, banning the internet can be found online. <laughs> and there's now even a brother to say when you buy certain goods through a certain website, Birchas Amazon. <laughs> anyway, I was relieved to discover that our honoured guest hadn't put his name to this, as I personally feel that the way to attract less observant and unaffiliated Jews to Yiddishkeit is through the tool of the internet. So I continued to find out something about this Jonathan Sachs. My daughter, who has just moved to London to a postgraduate Hill House in Golders Green, said to me, you know the warden there, Dad? He's Jonathan Sachs. So I said, I'm pleased to hear you've been actively planning for your impending retirement by taking a part-time job. <laughs> no, that wasn't you I discovered when I looked on the guy's Facebook page. So I had to do more research. I googled Jonathan Sachs, and this is what came up. BBC News Africa, Jonathan Sachs Security and Defence Chief. Nigeria's president, good luck Jonathan, has sacked his national security <laughs> advisor and defense minister amid mountain violence in the north. Security aide Awoye Azazi will be replaced by Sambo Dacuzzi. I then looked at the guy on Google Images. No, it's not you. However, according to Wikipedia, Lord Sachs was appointed as chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth in 1991. So by my reckoning, one of his earliest official duties was to open the Manchester Bayit. How fitting is it then that our celebration of the coming of age of the Bayit, Lord Sachs is honouring us again in one of his last official duties as Chief Rabbi. I recall as a student, I must have a good memory, I wasn't a student for long, <laughs> When I lived in Golders Green and regularly davened in Dunstan Road Shawl when Lord Sachs was there of there. Those days the main minion had more people than the alternative minion. And I actually remember walking home with you one, once, proudly telling you one of my uncles was one of your lecturers at Jews College, the late Rabbi Sidney Lepra, Zaytad Sadiq Ivrocha. And that is one of our connections. But actually, we do have more in common. We both attended Eitz Chaim Yeshiva in London. But I bet you didn't leave the kitchen window open at night so you could sneak back in in the early hours after a night out in the West End. Or maybe you did.
But of all the things we have in common, the best is, by this time next year, neither of us will be Chief Rabbi. <laughs> As someone said to me last week, Oh Michal, I believe you're speaking at the dinner with the Chief Rabbi. I hope he's careful what he says in front of you. <laughs> or was it the other way around? <laughs> you will all be pleased to hear that tonight's dinner is in aid of B'nai Kiva and not, as rumoured, part of the Chief Rabbi's retirement fund tour. So tonight, as you can see, I have no sax appeal. Intellectual, articulate, intelligent, thought-provoking, a brilliant orator. But enough of me, I'm only the chairman. <laughs> a Kolel student had a discussion about his future with his Rov. Tell me, he said, I want to be a community rabbi, have my own pulpit. Are there any other qualifications I really need apart from my Samicha? Yes, said the Rosh Kolel. You need to have a fantastic imagination. Oh, why, said the Kolel Nick. You need a good imagination, as when you get up to speak every Shabbos, you need to imagine people are listening to you. <laughs> Tonight's speaker certainly doesn't have that problem. When he speaks, everybody listens. So please rise, put your hands together, and welcome to the podium, the Chief Rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth, Lord Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Sachs. Beloved friends, Michael, I've decided I'm leaving the humor to you. <laughs> but you began by saying there is one opening line you've been waiting to say for years. There was one opening line I have been waiting to say for years. And a year and a half ago, Hashem actually gave me the opportunity to use it. The, the Pope was visiting Britain and I was asked to welcome him on behalf of all the faiths, all the non-Christian faiths. And the visit was actually Erev Yom Kippur. And I got up on Erev Yom Kippur to address the Pope and I claim my reward in Olam Haba that I did not say Good young Tiff Pontiff. <laughs> On the other hand, Michael, you are entirely right that in Hamilton Terrace you don't ever think of opening your letters for yourself. In fact, when Elaine and I arrived at Hamilton Terrace, one of our neighbors said to us, You know, you've come here and you've really joined the Heicher Fenster. And I said, what, you know, how do you recognize that you've arrived among the Heicher Fenster? And he replied, here, they schlog kaporas with peacocks. <laughs> However, the truth is, it's a delight and an honor for Elaine to be, and myself to be with you this evening to say a wonderful uh, hello again to your wonderful shlichim, Chagai and uh, Moria Shoham, who spent a wonderful two years here and have come back specially for this evening. <laughs> it's wonderful to see with us the Rav Shliach, Rav Goldman, who has just 
about to complete four years of wonderful service to Manet Giva Rav Goldman. We're honored by that present. And I want to say a special uh, word of a sense of privilege that this evening I have the privilege of sitting next to a man who's given more brachot and more blessings, more chesed and more inspiration to Manchester than anyone else I know, the wonderful, wonderful Reverend Gabriel Brody. <laughs> this is actually an evening of nostalgia for me because Michael is quite right. One of my opening encounters, one of the first things I did in Manchester, 21 years ago was to open the bite. And I don't know if you remember that occasion we had, I, uh, pretty much nearly a thousand people there. And there was a Hachnosa Sefer Torah, wasn't there at the time, if my memory serves me correct. And I just felt with all the people there, we had to dance around. So we started dancing and everyone joined in. And I think it was the Independent who had sent a journalist to cover the uh, whole trip. It was a very uh, crowded trip. And uh, she was there covering a non-Jewish journalist. And she wrote about that occasion. And I, I thought that was one of the most beautiful things I ever saw. She wrote in The Independent, now I know what it must have felt like to watch King David bring the ark into Jerusalem. And it was just beautiful. And that is the kind of thing B'nai Kiva do. The kind of simcha, the kind of hitlavut they have, the joy, the energy, the passion, that love of Israel, of the Jewish people, and of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that makes an impression. And therefore, one other moment that I will never forget is a national weekend, B'nai Kiva National Weekend, that we spent many years ago in North Wales. And uh, I have to say, it was freezing. <laughs> and there were 900 people sitting there. And I was sitting next to the youngest man in the room, Arya Handler, of blessed memory, who is already well into his middle or late 80s. And I said to myself, we've got to do something to warm this place up. So I said, Arya, you're the youngest man in the room. You are now going to stand on your chair. And I'm going to stand with you. And we are going to sing, Kol Alam Kulo Geshet Samot. Arya did that, just that. He stood on his chair. And I stood on my chair. And we started singing. Anyone, was, anyone remember that occasion? And 900 people stood up and sang Geshe Zamaot. And the whole building was shaking. Now, for security reasons, there were a lot of Welsh police there. And they immediately rushed in to see what was happening. God forbid something's happening. And they came in, and they saw everyone standing on their chairs, singing at the top of their voices. And they said, never before have we seen such exuberance in the absence of alcohol in our lives. It was a wonderful occasion. Now, four years later, we had another national weekend at the same venue. This time there were 1,200 people. And this time it was just as cold. The only trouble was that Arya Handler had made Aliyah at the young age of 91. And to my amazement, the man who had been chief of police four years earlier had specially requested to be assigned on that duty because he had had such a wonderful time watching everyone sing Geshe Zamod. So that evening, in the absence of Arie, I said to the Chief Commissioner of Police, you are going to have to stand up and sing Geshe Zama. And you know what he did? And 1,200 people stood and sang, and we raised the roof again. And that is the kind of magic 
that B'nai Akiva has that I am sure you'll find elsewhere, but I have not found in any other youth group or any other aspect of Anglo Jewry. It was just beautiful. And those two memories will stay with us as long as we live. And there are other memories that I, I'm very fond of. I remember uh, an occasion when, for the first time, uh, we had, we, first time in my chief cabinet, we had a visit from the President of the State of Israel, the late President Chaim Herzog of Blessed Memory. And we received a phone call from 10 Downing Street um, would, uh, would the Chief Rabbi and, Le and Elaine uh, join the Prime Minister for lunch? He was making a little lunch, small lunch, in 10 Downing Street for the President of the State of Israel. And my office replied on my behalf, yes, the Chief Rabbi would very much uh, like to join the Prime Minister. And then a very embarrassed Whitehall voice said, uh, I suppose the Chief Rabbi will want to eat kosher. <laughs> So my office replied, probably. <laughs> and the man at the end of the phone said, listen to this, just listen to this. This non-Jew said, well, in that case, we will we'll all eat kosher, so that nobody should be embarrassed. The kachaya, the whole meal for everyone was kosher, just so as to make us feel at home. And then an awkward voice said, um, would the chief rabbi say grace? And we said yes. And an even more awkward voice said, do you think it could be a short grace? <laughs> <laughs> so we said we can manage that as well. Anyway, we made all the arrangements. We made all the arrangements. And finally, the day arrived. We went to, it was the first time we'd had lunch in 10 Downing Street, and we were ushered in eventually to the little dining room, 20 people. Um, Prime Minister, Foreign Secretary at the time, Douglas Hurd, Chaim Herzog, some other cabinet ministers, an Israeli cabinet minister, some members of the Lords. And uh, the waiters and the chef de protocol shimmered out of the room and we were just left, the 20 of us. And John Major stood up and said, I now invite the chief rabbi to say grace. And it was just then that I discovered that just when you think you've explained everything, there's one thing you haven't explained. I hadn't explained that if you're going to make a bracha, you have to have something to make a bracha on. Did I know the Hoyach of in 10 Downing Street thought it's terribly chic to sit down to an empty table? No food on the table. No waiters or chef the protocol to us. And the Prime Minister of England and the President of Israel are both looking at me. And what am I supposed to do? Consider my choices. Mitzad Echad, one option, I say a bracha over nothing, thus taking Hashem's name in vain, God forbid. On the other hand, I disobey the Prime Minister and put an end to 50 years of Anglo-Israel diplomacy. <laughs> I lifted my eyes up to the hills in search of salvation when, lo and behold, it came. Some member of the 10 Downing Street staff had decided in a fit of aesthetic enthusiasm that a gold ornament on the table would look more attractive if it were draped with a bunch of grapes. It was the only item of food in the entire room. I stood up, I made a bracha over grapes, I ate a grape, I sat down, honor was saved, and the world continued on its normal course. <laughs> after, the, after the meal, I went up to John Major and said, Prime Minister, you must understand, your faith is different from ours. In fact, you have more faith than we do. You are prepared to thank the Lord for that which we are about to receive. Whereas we, after long experience, prefer to have received it first. But I will tell you, 
one extraordinary moment, which I will never forget. And, you know, I've had the pleasure and privilege over this weekend of seeing your wonderful King David, Manchester, and Yavna, your wonderful Browden Jewish Primary School, and this morning to open the new King David Liverpool. And education has been a great, great passion of ours since I first came into office, as it was with my predecessor and his late predecessor. And it came about that for the first time, John Major and his wife Norma invited Elaine and myself for lunch with them at Checkers. And we'd never been to Checkers, and we were really, really looking forward to this occasion. And uh, the next week, an invitation came into our office from a Haredi group that were opening a new Jewish school. Pum, that day, that Sunday, that hour, that moment. And would I come and open the school? How do you make a choice like that? So I said, let's open a book and see. You know that the rabbis said in relation to an invitation for a prime minister, always pray for the government, for were it not for the government, we would eat one another alive. So society depends on respecting the government. On the other hand, Chazal said, call ear, any city that does, has Jews but no Jewish day school is to be excommunicated because the whole universe depends on the sound of children at their studies. So when it comes to a choice between society and the universe, the universe wins. We opened the school. We said, sorry, Prime Minister, we can't join you. So we missed our chance of lunch with the Prime Minister at Czechos. Now, HaKadosh Baruch Hu has a way of making sure that Ein HaKadosh Baruch Hu Mekapeach Scha Shel Kol He never causes us to forfeit a reward for a good deed. And evidently, Hashem thought that we'd made the right choice. Because a couple of years later, we get another invitation, this time we can say yes to, from John Major, to have uh, uh, join him for dinner with the then president of France, Jacques Chirac. So we go to Chequers for the first time, and we have a little dinner. There are about 60 people there. And it's very nice, John Major, Jack Chirac, it's really nice. Now, I don't know quite how to put this. We were not sitting at the top table. Now, I didn't expect we were with the Prime Minister of England and the President of France. Only towards the end of the meal, John Major rushed over and said, Jonathan, I'm terribly sorry you were supposed to be sitting on the top table with Mr. Chirac, but he brought an extra minister that we weren't expecting, so we had to sit you somewhere else. But I want you to have quality time with the President of France, so I'm going to take you and Jacques Chirac into my study, and you can have time together. So he took Jacques Chirac and myself into his study. Hello, you man. What happened next, I still have to pinch myself to believe it actually happened, but it did. He was just about to leave us when Jacques Chirac said, John, don't go, I want you to hear this. And he then proceeded to tell John Major and myself about how, as mayor of Paris, he had helped build a whole series of Jewish day schools. He mentioned the names of the organizations, Otsar, Torah, and Chabad. He said the French Jewish community criticized me because I'm uh, supporting the right wing, the from, but not against the non from, but I have to, he said, they care about education more. And he goes on and on and on about the importance of Jewish day schools. And I come back to Elaine and I say, you're not going to believe this. 
I have just heard the president of France give a lecture to the prime minister of Britain on the importance of Jewish day schools. Do you think I can get them to give the same speech to all our shuls? <laughs> and I have to tell you that it is those moments when you realize how much what we care about, the wider world cares about. When they see Jews loving Judaism, when they see us building Jewish schools and creating new generations of young Jewish children, they feel lifted. And this is something I've seen so many times without number. And it reminds me of another occasion. Actually, it happened immediately in the course of a, of a visit like this. It happened to be in Liverpool, sadly, 16 years ago, when uh, we heard on that late on the Saturday night in November 1995, about the tragic assassination of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin Zal. And on that occasion, John Major invited me to accompany him as, as part of the British delegation to the Levaya. And we went together. Uh, I have to tell you, <laughs> if there's a downside to going on the Queen's flight. It takes from North Alt to Israel, eight hours. You know, it gets uh, it's, uh, about twice as long as an ordinary scheduled flight. On the other hand, the company is better. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just uh, five of us, Tony Blair, Patty Ashdown, John Major, Malcolm Rifkin, and myself. And it was, it was an amazing, amazing evening. On the way back, John Major was not able to join us because he had to go on to New Zealand for a Commonwealth conference. And we flew back with His Royal Highness Prince Charles in the same plane. And it was a very interesting occasion because I was able to tell him what he didn't know and what you may not know. He didn't know this at all, that this was the first official visit by a member of the royal family to the State of Israel. He didn't know because he knew his father, Prince Philip, has visited Israel, but in a private capacity because Prince Philip's mother, Princess Alice, is buried there. And this was the first visit. Now, I was due to sit next to Tony Blair on the way back, but I, this was, I actually said to Tony Blair, look, there's a general election coming up. Have you ever sat and had a chat with Paddy Ashdown before? And, he said, no. And I said, well, look, you two sit together. You might, you know, you etc. I thought they might do a little electoral alliance and shatchan. What's the chief rabbi if not a shatchan? So I said, you sit together. He said, what will you do? I said, well, I've got a book to read. So we sat opposite each other. There are, there are only six seats, the one and one, Prince Charles and no one else sits opposite him and myself opposite Tony Blair and Paddy Ashton. And I had just one book with me because I'd come right from a, uh, in the middle of a tour and I just had a chumash, a mikros gedobos, a chumash with all the commentaries. So I'm sitting there learning Parish and Sashavua and Tony Blair is looking at this book absolutely intrigued because there is no English book laid out like a microscopic text in the middle, surrounded by commentaries. So he said, "What is that book, Jonathan?" So I started telling him what uh, what um, a microscopic is. Here's the biblical text. Here's Rashi. Here's his grandson Rashbam. Here's Ibn Ezra. Here's Ramban. And he's absolutely fascinated. And he said, "Would you teach us some?" So I said, why not? Someone wants to learn. Zogetus. <laughs> and so I sat giving a share on Parsha Sashivua. And Prince Charles, just across the aisle, it's a small plane, starts listening, and it's very interesting. And he comes and he stands in the aisle. And for an hour, I give a share in Parsha Sashivua to our future Prime Minister and our future King. And I got off the plane and I recited a line which 
I always, you know, dreamt one day I would recite a line from Psalm 119. I will speak of your statutes before kings and not be ashamed. And that moment had many consequences. It was the start of a very beautiful friendship with His Royal Highness, the start of a very royal, beautiful friendship with Tony Blair. And it did result in an event which maybe you don't know about, maybe you don't remember, and it's important to remember that a few years later, at his own request, not at our request, at his own request, Prince Charles asked if he could be permitted to join us in shul for a service. And I don't know if you remember what the service was. It was Yom Ha'atzma'ut, the 50th anniversary of the State of Israel. At his request, he came to Daven with us in St. John's Wood. We told him, for you we'll skip the kaparas mit peacocks. <laughs> Just come and enjoy. And he came and he davened with us. And it was not an inconspicuous visit because the service was actually televised. And I think we salute that moment. And we also salute Tony Blair, who became a loyal friend of the State of Israel, of a kind that, you know, we should be humbly proud of. And he gave a commitment that was tremendous. And the other person I would mention in this context is his successor, Gordon Brown. I'm sure you know this, but Gordon Brown loved Israel because his father loved Israel. His father was led the Scottish Friends of Israel, he used to go there twice a year. Gordon Brown told me he knew the geography of the Holy Land before he knew the geography of England. And Gordon Brown used to ask, please, could he come and come to Shul this time uh, in Finchley, in Kinloss, for Yom Ha'atzmaut. And I remember his face the first time he heard those thousand B'nai Kiva kids singing Hallel on Yom Ha'atzmaut there. He said he has never heard anything like it. And so Gordon Brown became not only a fan of Israel, but a fan of B'nai Kiva also. <laughs> Friends, those are some of the memories, and they are lovely memories, and we will cherish them. And what they have in common is that non-Jews, the world out there, wants to see us stand up for our faith. They don't want us to hide our faith or be embarrassed about our faith. They want Jews to stand up for the family. They think we understand family better than anyone else alive. They want to see us stand up for community. They think we have stronger, warmer communities than anyone else. They want us to stand up for tzedakah, that you share Hashem's blessings with others who have less. They love this. And I've seen this so many times without number. I was speaking to a group of Muslims, high flyers in the city, and one of them said to me, Chief Rabbi, can you stop being Chief Rabbi and become Chief Imam of Britain? And I said, I had Tsaras enough already. <laughs> I remember speaking at the United Nations in late August uh, 2000. We had a big summit of religious leaders, and a leading Indian guru came up to me and said, please, would I be his keynote speaker at his counter-conference? And I said, what's your counter-conference? He said, the World Conference of Non-Evangelizing Faiths. They love us because we don't try and convert them. I remember going with Elaine for an unforgettable week in Amritsa, which is the Jerusalem of the Sikhs. And I actually saw a Sikh stand up in front of 2,000 Sikhs in the university in Amritsa and say, you know what we need? You know what the Sikhs need? We need what the Jews have. It's called Shabbos. He said, you won't believe this. They spent a whole day just spending time with their family, and giving hospitality. We need Shabbos. And I thought, yeah, again, you know, come and give that drush in our shoes. 
And that evening, the Dalai Lama, believe this or not, the Dalai Lama turned to me in front of 2,000 people and said, you know, I feel a very special empathy with the Jewish people. In fact, he said, the only thing I'm short of is one of these things. He pointed at my yarmulke. He said, if I had one of those, maybe I'd be Jewish. So somebody found him a yarmulke. We had the Dalai Lama wearing a yarmulke for the whole evening. And he is a lovely, lovely friend. The truth is, we have to know that it is the joy of Emuna, so beautifully expressed by Bnei Kiva, that is our greatest gift to the world. And it is everything great about Judaism is encapsulated and embodied in Medina Yisrael. That is the place where you see Jewish life really come alive. I say to people, one of the most five most pressing problems facing humanity in the 21st century. And they come up with this obvious answers. Number one, the environment. Number two, terror. Number three, democracy. Number four, asylum seekers. Number five, the growing inequality between first world economies and third world economies. And then you stop and you realize that Israel was the first country before there was an Israel, before even the word Zionism was coined, where they planted forests instead of destroying forests. And when it comes to terror, that much derided barrier turned out to be the world's only effective non-violent protection against terror the world has ever seen. Number three, when it comes to democracy, Israel is the only living, vital democracy in the Middle East currently in turmoil. When it comes to asylum seekers, only two countries in the world have been made up of asylum seekers, in the United States and Medina Yisrael. And they came to Israel from 103 different countries, speaking 82 different languages, usually at the same time, and out of them made a great nation. And finally, the growing inequality between the first world economies and third world economies. Israel is the only country that in 50 years moved from being a third world economy to being a first world economy. Is, I call Judaism the voice of hope in the conversation of humankind. And Israel, the country's whose national anthem is Hatikva, meaning hope, is the living symbol of hope in the 21st century. So I congratulate B'nai Akiva on its 21st anniversary. I congratulate Manchester on your great, great Jewish community. I congratulate Anglo Jewry for the wonderful way in those last 21 years it has built more Jewish day schools than any comparable period in the 356 years of our history. I congratulate Israel for being Hatikvash Not Al Paim, the fulfillment of all our dreams and all our hopes. And finally, I thank you for the privilege of serving you for 21 and a half years. It has been the greatest conceivable honor and privilege, and we've enjoyed almost every moment. <laughs> I end by simply saying, my Hashem, bless us all, so that we may be a blessing to the Jewish people and to the world. Amen. <laughs>
wait to see this clip hang out for two minutes, so we don't have to cut to it now as I'm speaking to the chief of life. Thank you very much. Um, as I was saying, when we decided that there was only one person who we wanted to speak at our dinner, I wrote a letter with a certain amount of trepidation to the chief rabbi's office, saying, Chief Rabbi, we've heard you come to Manchester on many, many different occasions. We've heard you speak at the schools, in the shuls, at B'nai Akiva. We'd like something a little different. And my heart was in my mouth when I wrote that. Who am I? I'm Herzl Hamburger, a, you know, a, a mensch from, which I hope I'm a mensch from Manchester. And I ended up by saying, please, if you don't agree, please do not excommunicate me. And I think when you hear, when you've heard tonight what you've heard from the Chief Rabbi, he's fully encompassed every, all of our thoughts or desires, which has given us an insight into the humorous part of his life over the past 21 years into his life with the leaders of Anglo Jewry and more importantly with, with the leaders of world political, with the world political leaders and how they regard us as Jews. Chief Rabbi, Lady Sachs, Lady Steinberg, Rabbi Nim, friends all, members of Binerki and Maskirot, friends all. You know, on the 3rd of November 1991, we in Manchester changed a dream into an aspiration and an aspiration into reality with the building of the Manchester Bader Kiva by it, which as you heard before is the largest one, not only in the UK but also in Europe. It was only with your help and your support that we were able to do that and make it possible. Who would have thought, Chief Rabbi, that you would be here today celebrating the 21st anniversary of the opening of that bayit? That opening was on one of the most momentous for B'nai Kiva here in Manchester. You said at that time, Chief Rabbi, that that afternoon was one of the most emotional that you had experienced in your first year as the Chief Rabbi. Maybe being a member of B'nai Kiva, we had more particular significance. In last week's Sedra Lechlecha, Go For Yourself is a rough translation, the BA leaflet, which we all get on the Shabbat evening, Shabbat Lashem, relayed your idea about that journey, and I quote, there are times, especially as young people, when we tell ourselves that we're breaking with our parents and charting the path that is completely new. Only in retrospect, many years later, do we realize how much we owe our parents, and how even at those moments when we, felt, when we felt most strongly that we were setting out on a journey uniquely our own, and were in fact living out the ideals and aspirations that we learned from them. This is the very essence of B'nai Kiva, where individuals decide to be involved in their heritage, their Yiddish guide, through making Aliyah or through being involved in communal affairs. Chief Rabbi, when I hear you on Thought for the Day on the BBC, or dealing with the media, defending Israel and its right to exist, you are promoting the basic tenets of Jewish life in Yiddishkeit. I am personally immensely proud that you represent the face of Anglo Jewry to the non-Jewish public. Even in the House of Lords, as you said the other night, the bastion of British democracy, there is still anti-Semitism to a great degree, and that is in spite of everything that Israel does for the world, democracy, for science, and for uh, world, the world. You give all of us in Anglo Jewry a sense of being, and you fight that is all that is most important and precious to us. You express so eloquently our thoughts with each word, each sentence and each phrase appropriately tailored to a situation. And I as an ordinary member of Klau Yisrael quell and great, get great nachas as one of your enhanced family every time I hear you speak. Benedict Brogan in a recent article in the Catholic Herald Catholic Herald, and I just remind you, I don't get this every Friday night with the Jewish Telegraph and the, and the, and the, and the Chronicle, wrote that it's a great pity 
that the chief rabbi can't, for obvious reasons, apply for the job as being the next Archbishop of Canterbury. He's an intellectual, but with a, gi but with a gift for clear exposition. He believes in God, in marriage, and in a family. He's conciliatory rather than divisive. So you know, Chief Rabbi, that when you finally decide to retire as our illustrious, illustrious Chief Rabbi, you'll have a ready-made position with the, with the Catholics. No problem there, I'm sure. You've been, you've been a fantastic Chief Rabbi and will be so hard to replace. You have raised the stature of Anglo Jewry to new heights through the past 21 years. We know, as you said, you've met and you have good friends above with all with the political parties, with the Prime Minister, whether it's Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, or Margaret Thatcher. And they have learned from you what it, what it means and what the Jewish community provide, whether it's in the field of education, whether it's in, in, in the field of volunteers, which they're now bringing forward as one of the platforms, or whether it's in the midst of the day, which they've copied from Laura Davis. All those things which the Jewish community here in, in England have brought forward as being their own and now being copied by central government. Chief Rabbi, you will be sorely missed in Manchester. We wish you and your AD Sachs all the very best in whatever your future endeavours are. Thank you for coming tonight. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever had the Chief Rabbi come up to me. <laughs> Chief Rabbi. On behalf of the whole of the Nerkiva, on behalf of the, the inscription reads, on behalf of the Hanifim of Manchester Nerkiva and their parents, we thank you for joining us at the celebration of the 21st anniversary of the European Manchester Parliament. We also thank you for your inspirational leadership of Anglo Jewry during your chief rabbinate. And we wish you and Lady Sachs a long and happy retirement with your family. Please accept the enclosed as a small token of our gratitude. If you already have this safer, please let us know. same buffet on the left on the right so there's no point queuing up both please go and help yourselves and enjoy your dinner
and on laning days I always find Galilla a bind. Our next speaker is also not going to be Chief Rabbi next year, but in the context of tonight, he is a very relevant and important person. A Canton lad, JFS educated, he spent two years in Yeshiva Tatatel and also obtained a degree in Natural Sciences at UCL. He is described by his friends as a science geek. And I'm surprised he's prepared to show his face here in Manchester because he also is an Arsenal supporter. But his main claim to fame is he is the mask here of Bonaire Kiva. So please be silent for our next speaker. And I suggest you do so because he's a big lad and I wouldn't want to start with him. So, honoured guests, ladies and gentlemen, Johnny Sherman. Ramanin, Lady Steinberg, members of the original Bayer Committee, Chavre Ben Akiva. Firstly, on behalf of the Masquerade, I would like to thank all those who have organised tonight's event, which has been a great success so far. I think it is apt that this dinner is taking place the day after we read Parashat Bayera or Vieira, as we call it in the air. <laughs> as in the parasha of this Bar Shabbat, we find reference to the first ever community centre. Vaita Eshel be Be'er Sheva. And he planted an Eshel in Be'er Sheva. What is this Eshel that Abraham planted? Our commentators explain that the word Eshel is actually an acronym for Ochel Shtia Lina, food, drink, and lodgings. So Adam actually built what at first glance appears to be a pub. <laughs> However, Vayikra Sham Beshem Hashem Kelodam, and he called there in the name Hashem, the God of the world. The commentators explain further that after the guests at the Eshel had eaten and drank, Adam would say to them, Bless the one whose food you have eaten. Do you think you have eaten of my food? No, you have eaten of the food of Hashem. It is clear that the Eshel was more than just an inn. It was a beacon of monotheism, a place for Abraham to educate the indigenous people of Eretz Canaan in the ways of Hashem. Of course, Abraham's use of food as bait for educational purposes is solid proof that Abraham was in fact the first Yenik. Now, fast forward 3,000 years from hot Bear Sheva to less hot Manchester, and we find the very same thing. Amongst the pantheon of Jewish organisations and movements, B'nai Kiva stands alone as the voice of religious Zionism in the UK. We are the only ones standing on our chairs, singing and shouting about Tarabi Abodah. We passionately believe that hearing to every minute detail of halakha is pointless without an understanding of the bigger picture that the Torah can only be understood and kept fully when Am Yisrael are together in Eretz Yisrael. <laughs> At Yom Ha'atzma'ut last year, the chief rabbi said that B'nai Akiva is the greatest school of leadership anglo Jewry has ever created. And we see that this is true. Our machalot are as strong as ever, with record numbers of young people passing through our tent flaps to spend time absorbing our ideology through Tofniot, Shurim, and the unique atmosphere that everyone here knows so well. We are now the only youth movement that meets its members every single week. Over 1,000 people come to Svivar come to each week to spend two hours in our environment hearing what we have to say and being imbued with our passion for our ideology. And when one looks around the various communities in which Bnei Akiva runs activities, 
You need look no further than a Manchester as the paradigm of a Bene Hewitt community. And at the centre of it all is our very own Bayez, fulfilling the same purpose for religious Zionism as Abraham's first community centre did for monotheism. The modern Manchester Bayez has been the shining light for Bene Hewitt in the north for 21 years. Generations of Tanakhim have passed through its doors. Hundreds of Madrachim have been trained in its halls, and countless people have governed within its walls. We are indebted to those who founded the Bayit and made this possible, many of whom are here today. Your vision for a youth centre truly run by youth has allowed so many people to realise their potential, to develop their leadership and learn about their Jewish and Zionist heritage in a social, fun and dynamic environment. However, a bayit is not enough on its own. And that's why B'nai Akiva is firmly committed to the concept of shlichut from Israel. We strongly believe that Jewish education is inseparable from a Zionist education. And that shlichim are necessary to give us this message. On behalf of B'nai Akiva, I would like to thank Chagai and Moria for your two years of dedicated service to the Nehru. Despite the challenge of re-establishing northern family shlichut after a 20-year absence, you have endeared yourselves toward, towards the movement and the community, brought new life to the Bayit, inspired the current crop of Madrachim and Tanakhim, and were an invaluable resource to the running of the Nehru nationally on a personal and professional level. The fact that you have travelled back to be with us today speaks for itself. So what is our vision for the future? With the arrival of new Shlichim in a not-too-distant not future, we aim to continue the work of Haggai Moria. We want our values of Torah and Huda, of support for Israel and Aliyah, to run through the veins of the Manchester community. Starting with the younger Tanakhim at Salford Sviva, but not ending there. We want to see even more Tanakhim from Manchester, at Machane, and at all northern Sviva. But this isn't the appeal. I'm not talking about financial support here. That's for a few minutes' time. I'm talking about advocacy. We need you, the parents of the Manchester community, to be advocates for B'nai Akiva. It's not enough just to send your children to B'nai Akiva. But we need you to encourage others to do the same and explain why this is the best place for young people to receive a complete Jewish education with Israel at its heart. This dinner has celebrated what B'nai Akiva stands for and everyone here can testify to the positive impact B'nai Akiva has made on their families' lives and the community as a whole. Now it's our responsibility to ensure that B'nai Akiva continues to be an active force in the Manchester community and inspires the next generation of children with the values, values we so passionately believe in. Here's to the next 21 years. Kadima B'nai Akiva.